Hi, I'm Dan Bauer. This is CBA Office Centers. Today what I want to talk about are the advantages of structured equation models. That is, why might you prefer to use a structured equation model relative to a more traditional analysis such as a linear regression model. I'm going to talk about three principal advantages. One advantage is that in the structured equation model we can specify relationships among constructs that are purged of measurement error so that we can get unbiased estimates of the effects between our predictors and our outcomes. Another advantage is that we can test the structure of our model by evaluating its fit to the patterns of association in our observed data. A third advantage is that we can specify complex theoretical structures that are consistent with, conform to, the kinds of complicated hypotheses that we often have in behavioral and social sciences. So I'm going to illustrate these advantages with a particular example. I'm going to presume that we're studying uh, popularity among young children, let's say five to six year old kids. Uh, and we want to know what are the factors that predict the popularity of some kids versus other kids being more unpopular, maybe even rejected by their age mates. And so I'm going to uh, set up a situation where we're interested in predicting popularity as a function of emotion regulation. I'm going to represent each of these variables with a box. And so I have a box for popularity, and I have a box here for emotion regulation. I'm going to represent the effect between those two variables with this single headed arrow. Now, if we were to estimate this effect by a standard regression model, right, we would predict popularity as a function of emotion regulation, we would get an effect estimate for what that relationship is. We'll call that B1 for the effect of emotion regulation on popularity. And we would hope that our estimate would be an unbiased estimate of what that relationship really is between emotion regulation and popularity in the population. However, unfortunately, that estimate is often downwardly biased. And the reason why it tends to be too small is that we tend to measure our predictors with error. That is, we don't get perfect measures of our predictors. The reliability of emotion regulation is imperfect, and so we might have a reliability of, let's say, 0.8. That would indicate that 80% of the, the variance that we observe in our measured variable of emotion regulation is true variance. It, it is reflecting real individual differences in emotion regulation on the part of these five to six-year-old kids, but 20% of that variability is, in fact, measured in error. It's just noise. And that noise causes our estimate of B1 to be too small. Now, things actually get a little bit worse in the multiple regression model. Let's say we have two predictors of interest. So not only do we think popularity is affected by emotion regulation, presumably kids with better emotion regulation are more popular, we also think that popularity is affected by empathy. So the kids that have greater empathy are also likely to be more popular. And I'm going to represent the, the correlation between emotion regulation and empathy with this double-headed arrow and the effect of empathy on popularity with this single-headed arrow. And now we have a second estimate, B2, representing the effect of empathy on popularity. Now, in this situation, the measurement error problem actually becomes worse because now we actually don't know whether or not our estimates are going to be downwardly biased, as in the one predictor case, or in some cases they could actually be upwardly biased. For instance, if our emotion regulation measure is poorly, uh, poorly measured and has low reliability, then we're not adequately controlling for the effect of emotion regulation on popularity when evaluating the effect of empathy. Uh, and so then B2 might actually be larger than it is supposed to be. We would overestimate that effect. So basically the problem is when we try to fit these kinds of models in a standard regression framework, our effect estimates are biased due to the unreliability. We tend not to talk as much about reliability of our outcome measures, uh, such as popularity, but when we have measurement error in our outcome variables, where does that go? Well, it goes into the error term. I'm just going to represent that error with this, this little arrow here. And so any measurement error in there, because it's error, it's random, it can't be predicted by the predictors, it goes into the error. And that means it, it has the interesting consequence of not affecting our parameter estimates, our parameter estimates are not biased, but what is biased is our R-square, our model R-square tends to be too small. Uh, and then, of course, our standard errors for those estimates get inflated, and so we lose power to detect those effects. So measurement error is a bad thing all around. Well, the first advantage of the structured equation model is that it allows us to overcome this problem of measurement error. And the way we address that in the structural equation model is by obtaining multiple indicator measures for each of the variables that we're interested in. So if we're interested in emotion regulation, what we're really interested in is the underlying latent construct of emotion regulation. I'm going to represent a latent construct with a circle. 
And so we can't directly measure emotion regulation with perfect reliability, but we could obtain multiple indirect measures of emotion regulation. So for instance, we might have a five item scale that we ask um, observers of children within the classroom to rate the children on. And so we might have those five items. I'm going to represent those with these, these boxes, two, three, four, and five. And we're going to have these little arrows indicating that all five of these indirect measures of emotion regulation, what they share in common is that they measure emotion regulation. So whatever that common variance is across those five indicators is going to get pulled into this latent factor, and this latent factor then provides us with an error-free measure of emotion regulation. Likewise, we can have a measure of empathy, and so maybe we obtain this by having children watch three videos and asking them how the child within each video feels. All right, so maybe a child gets their lunch knocked on the floor. How do you think that child feels? And so we have these three uh, little videos or vignettes that we have the child uh, provide, uh, provide us with information on how they believe the child feels, and then we, we rate that as a measure of empathy. Now those two latent constructs are going to be correlated, as, as uh, we described previously in the regression model. And we expect that each of them is going to predict popularity. Right? So we're going to have arrows going from each of those to popularity. And popularity also we would ideally measure with multiple indicator variables. And so we might have one, which is do you have a lot of friends? Maybe we just simply ask the child, do they have a lot of friends? Another question might be, do you feel like you fit in? And a third question we might ask the child is, do you feel other children like you? So those might be our three indicators of popularity. All right, so a, a chief advantage of the structural equation model is that when we get our estimates here of B1 and B2, those estimates are not going to be contaminated by measurement error and will be unbiased estimates of the true effects of emotion regulation and empathy on, population, or on popularity in the population. Now, that is assuming that the structure that we've specified here is accurate. And one of the other advantages of the structural equation model is that it provides us with tests of whether or not our models actually do reproduce the observed associations among our variables. So our observed variables are these boxes, these indicator variables. And our model right now is assuming that the relationships between those indicator variables are accounted for by the, the associations among these latent variables. All right, so these three measures of popularity are associated with these five measures of emotion regulation through this effect here and how those measures load on their corresponding latent factors. Likewise, these three measures of empathy are related to those three measures of popularity through the latent factors, and these measures of empathy and those measures of emotion regulation are related to through these two latent factors. So we can evaluate whether or not the patterns of association implied among these observed indicator variables is consistent with the actual associations that we observe in our empirical data to determine whether this model is a reasonable model uh, for our our data or not. So we obtain tests of model fit, we get chi-square tests of model fit, as well as numerous fit indices we can use to triangulate on the quality of our model for the data. All right, so advantage number one, we can account for unreliability. Advantage number two, we can test whether or not our model is consistent with the data in ways that we, we can't for a standard regression model. The third advantage is that we can, we can specify more complex models than we can within a, a traditional regression framework. So for instance, let's say that we believe that there's actually an intervening variable in these links, that the reason why kids who are better at regulating their emotions and have higher empathy, the reason why those kids are more popular and less likely to be rejected by their peers is that they engage in more pro-social behavior. All right, so I'm gonna create another latent variable, pro-social behavior. I'm gonna say that's measured by ratings from the teacher. We just ask the teacher how often the child engages in pro-social behavior, and we also ask the parent. And so we have a two indicator latent factor there. And we argue here that emotion regulation and empathy both predict higher levels of pro-social behavior, and pro-social behavior in turn predicts higher levels of popularity. So we can specify models like this that embody a, a more complex theory, a theory that talks about a causal chain where these factors, emotion regulation and empathy, affect popularity, but through their influence on pro-social behavior, which ultimately is the more proximal cause of that, that difference in popularity. Now, 
Again, we can test whether or not that model is consistent with the associations that we see in the observed data. And we can compare the fit of that model to alternative models. So for instance, we could speculate that maybe all of the effect of emotion regulation and empathy runs through pro-social behavior, but maybe there's also some direct effect of empathy and emotion regulation on popularity that does not run through pro-social behavior, that is independent of pro-social behavior. So we could test the fit of a model that includes these red arrows versus a model that excludes them and see which model fits the data better. So that's the third principle advantage of the structured equation model is that we can evaluate uh, complex model structures and see for alternative models which model fits the data better, which model is more consistent with the patterns of association that we actually observe in our data. All right, so just to recap, we can account for unreliability, we can test the fit of the model, and we can specify models that more closely conform to the kinds of hypotheses that we tend to have in the behavioral and social sciences, which often involve these sorts of uh, causal chains or mediation mechanisms. All right, well, I hope that was helpful in illustrating uh, some of the reasons why you might prefer to use a structural equation model versus a more standard linear regression model. Uh, and, and kind of gives you a sense of why people find the SEM such a compelling thing. Thanks very much for your time. See you next time.